Well, very nice to be here. Uh, I, I gather we've got an hour, and um, I'm going to be unpardonably telegraphic to start with, um, so as to uh, give as much time as possible for Q&A. Keynes famously said, in the long run, we're all dead. And the question I want to ask is whether he's dead or whether he's alive. I have to say straight away that I think he's very much alive, but I think um, I'll need to explain exactly in what, in what senses he's alive. Um, there's been a modest revival in Keynesian thinking in the last eight or nine years, uh, propelled by two events. First of all, the collapse of 2008, uh, which was entirely unexpected, unpredicted, and uh, um, uh, in other words, off the radar screen. Um, it, 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 it couldn't have happened, it, but it did happen. And so orthodox economics macroeconomics was in a mess. And the second surprise was the um, failure of non or anti-Keynesian uh, policies to help um, economies back to normal activity. Um, uh, eight years after the start of the slump, growth is either sluggish uh, and in Europe non-existent. Um, real incomes haven't recovered to their 2008 level. And um, specifically monetarism, Mark II, or known as quantitative easing, uh, has uh, uh, failed to lift real activity. What it has done is to lift asset prices, uh, and in other words, making the already rich uh, richer than they had been. Um, so fiscal policy, which is Keynesian territory, is back in, creeping back into fashion. And two pointers to that are um, uh, Robert uh, Hammond's, Hammond's uh, autumn statement, uh, of last week. Um, first of all, he has abandoned Osborne's absurd fiscal target of balancing the budget by the end of this parliament. And he's left, in other words, about 2% of GDP room, uh, wiggle room. And secondly, he's put his toe into the uh, infrastructure in infrastructure investment. Um, although only to the tune of about £23 billion pounds over five years, which isn't very much. And if you look at the situation, Hammond, Trump, Draghi, Juncker are all singing the infrastructure song without, of course, a mention of Keynes. I think politics has had more to do with this turn than economics. Specifically, it's been the rise of populism, uh, which has caused fears of a revival of fascism. Populism is not fascism, but it does have one very important thing in common with fascism, and that's why I think it's uh, the media labelling of populism as right-wing extremism is, is, is wrong. Its economic programme, the economic programme of all the populists, is actually quite left-wing. And you rem you'll remember that Nazi stood for National Socialist. There was a socialist bit. And the populists repudiate austerity and, and promise, among other things, big infrastructure investment programs. And Trump has vowed to maintain existing welfare entitlements. So unless Francois Fillon, who is, res who is a respectable right-winger, uh, moves to the left in France, it's quite possible that, the, uh, that Marie, Marine, Marie Le Pen will become French president in May. It's not, not at all unlikely. Um, of course, moving to the left doesn't mean renouncing every single liberal value, and in fact, that shouldn't be the case, as Trump did in his presidential campaign, but it does mean in importing an element of nationalism into a program, and that is going to be the, the populist mix, as, we, as we've already seen it, and, and it'll become more obvious. We need to recognize that there's an inchoate popular revolt going on, of which Brexit is our nearest example, against globalization. Um, and um, uh, it's associated neoliberal politics and economics. So that's roughly, I think, the political setting of this <coughs> revival of Keynesianism. But to turn from politics to economics, uh, 
There are two kinds of Keynesians. Um, <coughs> they're what I call policy Keynesians and those mainly interested in Keynes's ideas and in his method of doing economics. And of course the two overlap, <coughs> but their priorities are different. From my limited knowledge of how economics is taught at Oxford, how many people actually are doing economics? <coughs> Quite a few. <coughs> um, I would call Oxford the home of that branch of policy Keynesianism known as New Keynesianism. Um, and what's, what's the credo of New Keynesianism? Well, New Keynesians reject the idea that e economies are self-balancing, automatically self-balancing at full employment. Aggregate demand can be deficient. New Keynesians have been strong critics of Osbornism, of fiscal austerity, the belief that cutting the deficit in a recession is the royal road to recovery um, by releasing resources for private spending. Uh, they say, on the contrary, that um, it, it tends to make recession worse rather than better. New Keynesians accept the theory of rational expectations working within the boundaries set by the new classical school, especially micro-founded, sorry, I'm going to <coughs> use a few bit of economic lingo, um, including micro-founded optimization. They tinker with the, the new classical models to, in order to justify stimulus policies in a slump. They sort of stretch the boundaries in order to create a policy space. For, for, for themselves or for stimulus, but they explain unemployment or persisting unemployment by sticky, sticky wages and prices. Um, and that prevents you know, instant adjustment back to full employment. So that's the line they take. Uh, instead, the economy adjusts through income changes, which lead to a position of underemployment equilibrium. <coughs> now, but according to the New Keynesians, this is a short-run problem. Ultimately, the economy is self-correcting, but in the short run, there is policy space for a government to do some stimulus to exploit, again, another term of art, short-run Phillips curve to improve on the inferior equilibrium. Now, of course, Simon Wren Lewis is one of the leading New Keynesians in Oxford. I don't know whether any of you go to his lectures or whether any of you have him. Um, and he has calculated that Osborne's austerity policy has cost the United Kingdom 5% of lost growth in the last six years. That's about £1,500 per family, per household. <coughs> Many new Keynesians are left-wing in the sense that they believe in strong regulation of the financial system and also care a lot about income inequality. Their Keynesianism is one element in a broader outlook, though it adds support to the, the policies they, they believe in um, um, uh, politically. To sum up, New Keynesians, New Keynesians abandon the main theoretical and methodological insights of Keynes in order to win policy space for Keynesian policy within a rational expectations framework. So that's New Keynesians. Then there are the theory Keynesians, I call them the theory Keynesians. They're often called post-Keynesians, and they see Keynes's main contribution as the concept of radical uncertainty. Uh, and this arises from our inability to predict a future which is shaped by complex, um, un, un, unknowable human interactions. The future isn't given as it is in physics. Um, it's always been created by human beings, and that, that creates uncertainty, uh, pretty radical uncertainty. And their main concern isn't with uh, the stability of Keynes's sort of underemployment equilibrium, but with the instability of capitalism. In other words, they reject all theorizing the post Keynesians based on any equilibrium idea over time. They have used Hyman Minsky's. Um, financial instability hypothesis to explain how the banking system was so fragile in the run-up to the slump um, as against the orthodox uh, hypothesis that all financial markets are perfectly efficient. Um, uncertain, un, um, 
uncertain expectations is what makes investment so um, unstable. Our best bets can be upset by too many things and it's anxiety about the future, not sticky wages and prices, which explain um, why you have lots of uh, unemployment as a normal condition. Only a theory based on uncertain expectations, say the post-Keynesians, can really be regarded as a general theory. Um, and Keynes's book was called The General Theory of Employment. Um, and the post-Keynesians have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, they have a lot more to say about the origins of the crisis than they do about what you should do once um, the crisis has happened. Uh, the post-Keynesians are very policy. Their, their account of the origins of the crisis is rather sketchy, but they know what to do when it's happened, whereas the post-Keynesians have a rather good account of how these crises occur, but they're not so good on, on, on policy. Then I, I, I um, turn to my third category of Keynesians, um, whom I call the methodological Keynesians. Um, the, un the insertion of uncertainty into the heart of economics has profound implications about how you do economics. Uh, the this is the territory of methodology. First of all, I mean, I, I just highlight four of them. First of all, if, you're, if you take Keynes's methodology seriously, that destroys marginalism and indeed mathematics as a general method, since marginalism depends on calculable probabilities. Keynes in economics um, sort of leads into the study of decision making under uncertainty. It opens the door, for example, to behavioral economics, which is, a, which is a, a, an offshoot of psych, psych, psychological um, uh, accounts of human behavior. So it, it opens that particular door. Secondly, it destroys Lionel Robbins's, this is, this is if you take Keynes' methodology seriously, destroys Lionel Robbins's definition of economics as the science of scarcity since it strongly suggests that an unmanaged market economy is dominated by excess supply. It's not an economy of scarcity. There's a lot of unused resources normally, or as economists here, students will, will gather, it means that Say's law doesn't hold as a general rule. Third, it denies that macroeconomic outcomes can be understood as a result of micro, um, micro foundational um, sort of decision making. Macroeconomics, which is the study of the whole, how the whole economy works, is just macroeconomics and nothing else. It makes no strong assumptions about individual human behavior. And fourth, just because it is the study of the relationship between different aggregates, like consumption, investment, money, and so on, um, it opens the door to other social sciences, like history, politics, sociology, uh, literature, which take it for granted that society shapes individual behavior in some way or another. We're not just atoms who take these decisions sort of in isolation from each other. I mean, no social study believes that, except economics. So it opens the door, um, if you take Keynes's methodology seriously, it opens the door to these other um, disciplines and uh, emphasizes that the re relationship between individuals and their society is a recursive one. It's not a causal one that goes from one, the individual, to the society and you just add up a whole lot of what individuals have decided and you get the results at the top level. You know, Keynes never believed that and his methodology um, simply uh, rules it out. An obvious example of, of, of the weakness of orthodox economics and the strength of a more recursive view of, of, um, uh, of, of the relation between individuals and societies is, 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 is in consumer, consumer preferences. I mean, orthodox economics lords consumer sovereignty without inquiring into how these preferences are shaped by advertising, manipulation, 
and, and you know, the general order of, uh, of society. So, <coughs> um, I come to my last point. Keynes uh, remains essential in one other way. John Stuart Mill said, a good economist must be more than an economist. And Keynes lives up to that pretty, pretty accurately. Uh, he was much more than an economist, and he brought the benefits of a wide education to bear on the economic problem. He never stopped asking, what's economics for? If economic growth is a means to an end, what is that end? What is it a means to? If it's a means to happiness or the good life, how are we con to conceptualize these and how are we to relate our economic growth to ideas of the good life? Um, are there ethical limits to growth? Wearing Keynesian spectacles, these ethical questions come ver into very, very sharp focus. Uh, but they don't come into such sharp focus if, you, if, you, um, if, you, if, if your economics is much more narrow than that. Properly conceived and taught, Keynesian economics should open up a big field of inquiry into what Hannah Arendt called the human condition. The problem with the policy Keynesians is that they shut down the links with Keynes's larger purposes by choosing only those bits of his thinking which can be fitted into their short-term policy equations. And that's terrific impoverishment. But most of Keynes's thought escapes mathematical straitjacketing. Um, in other words, Keynes was primarily a humanist, not a technician. Um, it's because he raises the perennial questions of human existence that he will remain fresh long after the technicians have had their day and their say. In other words, Keynes is still alive. So um, that's all I have to say. So you've skirted around a number of important issues, uh, including populism and, and mentioning Donald Trump. And you recently argued that Trumpism could be a solution to neoliberalism. But doesn't Trump also embody a neoliberal ideology in many ways? How can he simultaneously sort of perpetuate it and also be a solution to it? Well, populists are all over the place, aren't they? I mean, and Trump is just as messed up as, as the others. I mean, he hasn't got a coherent view of things, but, but he, has, he has views. And you, you might say that they're incoherent, and they probably are. But he has one important view, and I think that attracted a lot. Well, why did, why did, why did Trump um, get elected president, no, on a minority of votes, by the way. Um, one is that a lot of Americans have done very, very badly economically in the last um, uh, uh, 8, 10, 20 years. You know, you've got really a collapse of, 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 of median incomes. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, they're, they're doing very, very, they're, they're not doing well out of, out of the system as it now is. <coughs> Immigration played a part, of course it did, as it plays a part in populism um, in, in Europe. And when jobs are very insecure, um, when you, your, your future is, is, is you know, not, not, not looking bright, of course popular opinion turns against immigrants. And so that, that, is, that is one of the responses. There's a, there's a big business side. I mean, Trump is someone who comes out of business. So, of course, he favors reduced taxation and especially getting corporate, ta corporate taxation down, which is exactly what um, the corporation tax down, which is exactly what Hammond did. Um, but that's also a stimulative measure. Um, in, in, uh, in, in Keynesian terms, that, that is one way <coughs> you can encourage uh, investment. But, but at the centerpiece of, of his policy, I think there is a very, very large infrastructure program. I mean, a trillion dollar infrastructure program. Um, and that's much bigger proportionally than, than Hammond's timid efforts or uh, pledges. So I think the idea of getting America moving, um, is, 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 it was, was, was a powerful message. 
There's also been in American politics, more I think than in post-war European politics, a strong, a strong vein of populism. It's always been there and it, it comes up throughout history. I mean, in, in, in the end of the 19th century, the, the populists and the progressives, in, even in Roosevelt's era, Huey Long, I mean, in the post-war period, people like um, uh, Governor Wallace of Alabama, these people have come, for their, and, and, and they've come, but they've never won. So there's, there's, um, there has been a change. There has been a change of mood, it, a real, you might call it peasants' revolt, if you want to use a very old historical term, against the elites. Yeah, and in, in the article you wrote about uh, Trump being a solution to neoliberalism, or Trumpism rather, you said liberals should not turn away in disgust and, and despair, but rather engage with Trumpism's positive potential. Well, yeah. Um, which, which is a very interesting stand to take because a lot of people on the left are saying, oh, we should do everything we can to avoid normalising Trump. Um, do you think in any way that critique is at odds with what you put on the table, or do you think that critique is actually invalid? Well, it, it is at odds. I mean, I, I think he's going to be president, I mean, unless, you know, something happens, um, like a violent death or something. I mean, he's going to be president for at least four years. He's going to be president of the most powerful country in the world. Well, you want something sane to come out of it. Um, and therefore, people who have sane ideas, which are compatible with some of Trump's ideas, ought to work with him. I mean, in fact, the, the defeated uh, uh, left-wing Democratic candidate, what was his name? Um, Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders said exactly the same thing. Um, he said, yeah, you've got to just take the good bits of Trump's program and, make sh and engage with them and, 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 and try and make them work. And, um, well, you, you hold your nose up, you know, you, you, you try and avoid some of the bad smells because you can't influence those, but you try and do, you try and do what, um, make the best of his presidency. And he'll need, he'll need help. He's, I mean, he's, he's got no experience of government. Um, I don't know. I mean, people say things about him which suggest he's completely incapable of running, running a, a government. But I mean, we're going to find out about that. And of course, there's a, one very important difference from fascism, which I think one's got to, one's got to understand. And, and that's why this isn't the centre totally disintegrating. Um, there was very little constitutional um, um, uh, obstacles in Weimar Germany um, to Hitler's assumption of supreme power. I mean, the constitution really facilitated it rather than um, rather than prevented it because it had a sort of all-powerful president um, at its head. And once Hitler could just get to that because the old incumbent died, there was nothing there to stop him doing whatever he wanted. <coughs> Whereas the American Constitution is a checks and balances constitution. One's always got to remember that. Um, now in Europe, um, you again have these checks. I mean, in Germany, I mean, they deliberately created systems of government after the war to prevent one person doing exactly what they wanted. And you have a small illustration of that in the, in the Supreme Court decision in this country to go against Theresa May's idea to use the royal prerogative to um, uh, uh, carry um, Article 50. They said it must be done by Parliament. So you've got these checks and balances, in, 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 and, 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 and that's also what makes this a different period, I think, from the interwar years. We've learned something, but what we haven't learned is that you've got to have full employment, security, and, and some secure basis of life if, you're going to, if, you, if you want to prevent these outbreaks from happening again. Yeah. Let's bring it to the UK quickly. And in another recent interview, you said, there must be some principled politicians left, but you don't hear from them because they almost s never rise to the top. Is Jeremy Corbyn the exception to this rule? In other words, is he the principled politician that has rise to the top? There's something quite authentic about Jeremy Corbyn, which is, I think, I don't think he's you know, really top caliber, but there's something people feel there's something authentic about him, that you know, he believes in what he says, that he takes principled stands. And, 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 and it's quite surprising that he ever got to the top, really, when you think of it. It's also 
very odd. He was for 30 years a completely undistinguished backbencher. He was a bit of a rebel, but he was never appointed to any office, which would be classic kind of co-option tactic. Um, uh, but, but somehow he didn't, either they didn't think he was good, good enough or they thought he was too unreliable or whatever it was, but he never got into office. And um, he, he, he simply was um, an outcome of the terrible demoralization of the Labour Party after, after the, 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 the loss of 2010. And what would have to be considered the weak leadership of Ed Miliband and the, the, the failure of the Labour Party under Miliband and under um, lately come dancing Ed Balls um, to um, develop a counter-narrative. Um, and, and therefore the Conservatives got away with absolutely you know, this whole lot of lies about, about the state of the public finances and everything else. And, and Labour won. So Labour, the, the, the fact that Labour lost so badly um, again in 2015 sort of meant that the, all of the old leadership, the heirs to Gordon Brown, were sort of discredited. So you think Keynes might be key to that counter-narrative? In coming general elections, yeah, I think I think I think there was a counter narrative, and I think um, uh, it should have been f put forward at at the front of politics. I mean, a few of us tried to put it forward and argue and argue and argue, but we weren't, you know, well, we weren't in, in political leadership positions. I mean, Simon Ren Lewis has argued this. I mean, compellingly um, here, um, and. Um, uh, but the Labour Party never took it up. They were too scared about the debt, the deficit, the uh, problem of the budget, uh, without realising that the only, only point of the budget is its relationship to the economy. Uh, that, that, that's, that's the point of the government's budget. It, 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 it's, not, well, you know, it's not an internal thing that it must balance its accounts on its own. It balances its accounts by balancing the economy. That's how the budget works or should work. And that was something, but I don't think people understood that. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm always puzzled by this, that it, it seemed to be more compelling to say we must live within our means, that we have left our country and future generations unbelievable quantities of debt unless we do something about it. Um, that, um, uh, you know, uh, it seemed to me people responded more to that than to a simple idea that, you know, if no one's spending money, you're not going to get any employment, <laughs> uh, which I thought, would have thought was also quite a simple idea. But. Yeah, so last question from me before we go over to the floor. Um, you were one of the founding members of the Social Democrat Democratic Party in 1981 and stayed on until 1992, until its dissolution. Given the sort of sorry state of the Labour Party, do you think it's possibly time for another Liberal splinter party? Well, the Liberals didn't do very well in the last election, did they? Uh, <laughs> there isn't. There isn't. I don't think there's space for another... I mean, the only, the only space for another party there was was for UKIP. And that was the most successful third party in terms of popular votes. Um, maybe the Liberal Democrats did do better at, at various times. But of course, uh, UKIP, um, uh, in, in a continental system, uh, you know, anything like proportional representation or anything like that, um, even under the alternative vote, um, they would have had 30 or 40 seats in Parliament instead of one. Um, and so I, 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 there may be space for another party at some point, but at the moment, I mean, what, what would be the possibilities? There would be that you could imagine a sort of remain party um, uh, forming, um, but A, um, the horse has left the stable, um, and B, I don't think it would be very popular. I don't think any party that aimed in any way to reverse the results of the referendum would get many votes. So the answer is no. All right, thanks. Uh, if you have a question, please put your hand up high and wait until the microphone gets to you. Uh, let's go to the gentleman there. Hi. Um, what do you think were some of the main things that Keynes actually got wrong? Um, the main things that Keynes got wrong. I thought, I think, 
I think he didn't um, pay enough attention to the issue of maybe confidence. I think if you're in a globalized, I mean, you see, he, his world was very much, I mean, his model, if you like, was a closed economy model. And it, once you're in a globalized, in a global economy, um, the, the, um, the demand for belief in, in, in his remedies is much harder. I mean, it's much more severe because, I mean, you have these markets and they have to make money, you know, and they bet um, on, 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 on um, what governments are doing the whole time in a way, you know, by the, by the second almost. So it's, it's very, very hard to put, push a Keynesian policy if the markets are very much against it. Now, I think that is a fault of Keynesians, Keynesians, and I think it's a fault of policy Keynesians as well. I mean, Krugman calls it the confidence fairy, is one of his phrases. He says government should disregard the confidence fairy. I mean, it's just all the people who sort of um, say you mustn't do sensible things because the markets won't stand for it. He's also coined uh, this phrase about um, uh, bond bond vigilantes who sort of cr you know stop governments doing sensible things because they don't believe in them. It's a very it's a very interesting question. So I think confidence is 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 is, is one issue. I think um, I'm not sure Keynes didn't get it wrong, got this wrong, but longer term issues weren't on on his horizon so much. I mean he was really. That's why the policy Keynesians came to the fore. He was really interested in this very, very, um, this instability um, of, of short-term instability of economies. And the policy Keynesians said, well, we've got a cure for that. But when it comes to growth, there wasn't, there, you know, there were, it, it, it didn't really, um, Keynesians, Keynesianism had to be made up to deal with that. And of course, the, the problems of, environmental sustainability were way beyond um, anything Keynes was uh, concerned with. On the other hand, Keynes did say things which were ignored um, and which are very, very valuable. I mean, he, he, he had one strand of long-term thinking, which I think is very important, which is what's economics for? Um, he asked that question. You don't have to, you know, have to agree with his answers, but there's a marvelous essay called "Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren." That's about your age now, um, you know, which which tries to address that and says growth has to stop at some point. You can't just go on consuming more and more stuff. I mean, what what's it for? Um, what else? He was um, a bit elitist. Um, he. Um, he thought that um, the experts should really run things, I think. Um, and he might not think so, so much today. On the other hand, he was a great supporter of Roosevelt. And Roosevelt was, was a good populist, you might say. He's the, he was a good populist. He had, he had, he had decent, decent ideas, uh, decent instincts, and, and quite left-wing policies. I haven't, I could, go, I could go on a bit more. I don't want to say that he, Keynes got too much wrong. Uh, let's go to the glasses. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm not, uh, you know, familiar with economics. I'm just, I'm generally interested in the economics of inequalities, and I've read uh, Thomas Piketty's book, and I was wondering which school of Keynes. I was trying to kind of fit Piketty into your two models. Is he a policy economist in the sense that he is indeed very interested in you know policy and what can be done in, do in order to reduce inequalities, but he's also very much against neoclassical economics in the sense that he's against the mathematization of economics, he's against the marginal the, the marginalism of economics. He, he doesn't believe in the idea of equilibria. You know, the eco um, the economy is uh, the transition from one equi equilibrium to another. So where would you fit Piketty in in, in your model? Pick it, pick it yeah. Well, I mean, I think Keynes wasn't. He didn't regard income inequality as the most important issue. He regarded deficient demand as the most important issue in his time. <laughs> but at the, at, the, um, at the end of uh, the general theory, in the last chapter, he said, 
uh, the two most important problems facing modern capitalism are um, its inability to provide full employment and its inequitable distribution of incomes. He said this book is concerned mainly with the first, but my um, theory does have implications for the second, because basically what he thought um, would, 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 should be the case is that you have a policy of what he called the full employment investment policy, so that you have full employment. And then after a few years, when he thought that the returns from investment would fall off, then you should do um, some um, uh, redistribution in order to, what he called, increase the uh, propensity to consume. Because, of course, the rich save much more than the poor, so that, I mean, you don't want to have a lot of saving going on when the investment opportunities are falling off, so you re redistribute income in order to increase consumption. And that ties in with a sort of kind of under-consumptionist economics which has been revived recently. I mean, a lot of people are now saying is that one reason why we have this very, very unbalanced economy with a lot of money sort of concentrating in, 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 in the hands of the very wealthy, which means the con uh, tend and, and real incomes falling, um, median real incomes falling, the, the propensity to consume is quite low. And that's why it's, it's a sort of, you know, you haven't got a sufficient consumption base to keep to keep us going forward steadily. So he, 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 his, his economics does link up with that. And I think people who are under consumptionist would also be Keynesians. Um, but it's, 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 Keynes always thought of that happening rather later on. And he said the most important thing is to carry consumption, uh, investment to its ultimate point when, when you know, it, 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 it does, it, the world is full of capital goods and there's no further real returns um, um, uh, uh, to investment to justify further investment. That's when he thought you should start. And he, the other thing he said at that point, which I think links up so much with um, what people are talking about today, which is the threat of automation and what's going to happen to jobs. He said, well, we then have to choose also between how much we want to work and how much leisure how much of the increased income we want to take out in leisure. Um, and so he, he really believed that um, um, people would work less. Um, they wouldn't have to work as much uh, and would be rich enough um, to um, um, allow people to work a lot less. He thought that would happen as well. There's not much sign of it at the moment, but that's obviously something that is very much discussed in plans for basic income and um, giving people basic incomes. As, as the machines take over more and more human labor, you know, people can work less, but they've got to have replace, income replacements. And that leads into very, very interesting ideas of maybe you know, into uh, cooperatives, sh uh, workers being given shares in enterprises, um, so they don't rely entirely for their income on their, on their work income, you know, all kinds of things like that. But, come into, in, they're all suggested by Keynes, but of course, you know, he, he lived over a hundred years ago, <coughs> or about a hundred years ago. Let's go to the right at the back. Actually, the one, yeah, we'll go to the back and then the one just in front of the one at the back. So, yeah, both of you will start at the back. Thank you very much. Um, following on from your observations, <coughs> I was wondering whether Keynes had actually spent some time considering an economy where we didn't have any money. As a, as a freelance contractor myself, sometimes it, it's really tricky to know how much to charge when somebody turns to you and say, well, what do you want for that? And quite often what you do, you, you try to look at what everybody else is charging and, and pitch yourself there. And sometimes, even for myself, I thought, wouldn't it be good if we didn't have money? And I was wondering, did Keynes ever sort of postulate on a, on a utopia like that? A moneyless utopia? No, I don't think so. I think, I think the answer to your question, presumably, I an economist would just say you charge the market price, as it, as it, um, uh, uh, and that's a money price, you see. But, but so, so Kay, I mean, Kay, for Keynes, money was the, one of the big disturbing 
things in an economy. Um, but he didn't think you could solve it by abolishing money because basically then life would shrink. I mean, the economy would shrink to, to barter and you can't do much with barter. I mean, you can do something with barter, but you can't run a, 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 you know, a, a, a modern economic system on barter. What you can run are very local systems, and there have been, I mean, there are local systems which really dispense with money, um, certainly dispense with the money printed by the Bank of England. And they, you know, they, uh, and, and those things can run, but, but I don't think um, you, you, you can, um, you can, um, you know, do much, much other than local with them. Uh, and, um, of course, there are people who, who want to, I mean, curtail the role of money. I mean, I want to curtail the role of money in a way. I think, you know, it's, you know the, whole of, the whole of the financial system is just like a giant octopus. I mean, they just spend their time swapping money with each other. And, 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 and then when they all crash, everyone else suffers. Um, and some people have suggested one way you can limit the role of money is to abolish fractional reserve banking, you know, f force banks to hold 100% of reserves against their loans. So there are these schemes to rein in uh, money um, and, and to re-regulate it, but you can't imagine really a modern economy without money. Lovely, thank you very much. Could you just pass the mic to the person in front of you? Yeah. You said that the budget is there to like basically take care the of the economy, the economy and to stimulate yeah. and correct uh, whatever is wrong with it. So that kind of uh, fits in the Keynesian framework of sorting out the economy in the short run because in the long run like it will be balanced. But don't you think that unbounded use of the budget to sort out the economy in the short run will impede the ability and the credibility of the government which will affect the the ability to to balance it in the long run. Um, I'm just, I'm not like... I mean, I want to answer you. that before going on to your next point because I'll forget, forget it. And I, it. It depends where you are. I think one of the great, one of the great um, um, miscon misconceptions about Keynes is that he believed in running de you know, unbalanced budgets the whole time. Of course, he didn't. I mean, he, he said, you know, you, you, you unbalance the budget when you need to. Um, and, um, uh, 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 and, 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 and of course, insofar as if you're, if you're in a slump position and private saving is, uh, private spending is down, then government spending causes the economy to grow. And that, of course, is itself rebalancing because you're getting more revenues. The larger the economy, the larger the government's revenues will be at existing tax rates. So any government policy that causes the economy to be smaller is bound to make the deficit larger, uh, or at least um, uh, imp make it impossible for a chancellor who sets himself a, 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 a balanced budget policy over a number of years um, based on making the economy whose effect is to make the economy contract, can never fulfill his targets. And that's what happened with Osborne, you see. I mean, he set these targets and he never got there. Now, he, of course, the, the, the balance improved because the economy did grow a bit, but it, had it grown more, he would, have, he would have balanced the budget, balanced the books by now. It was on the revenue side that um, he, his targets failed, and he, they failed on the revenue side because the policy wasn't stimulating the economy. You see, that, that's the way I would argue the case. Um, do you think there is any case at all for contractory policy? Like, any case at so, all? Well, if, you're, if, you're, if, if, you're, if the economy is um, in inf inflate, if there's inflation, a lot of inflation, the economy is overheating, growing above trend, and then, of course, you should have what's called fiscal consolidation. You should, you should, um, you should make sure that um, uh, you raise taxes and you cut spending, of course, because there's too much spending going on. That's why prices are rising. Keynes always, Keynes made a very important distinction very quickly between capital budget and current, current spending budget. He thought the current spending budget always ought to be balanced and actually always ought to be in surplus. 
but it's on the capital side that a government needed to um, uh, to, to run uh, its uh, run a, a deficit, as indeed a business does. I mean, and when a business invests, I mean, it borrows money or it raises money. Um, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't uh, do all the investment out of its current earnings. Let's take a couple more questions. Uh, let's go to you over there in the corner. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to address the fact that you talked about Trump's stimulus plan as possibly Keynesian. And I was wondering what your opinion was on the comments that Janet Yellen had. Uh, basically the idea that it wasn't the right time to do this and it risked uh, spending this money rather than reserving a fiscal stimulus for a point in time when we are in the U.S. economy isn't growing and it would need it more. Well, uh, you mean the, the, the chair of the Fed? Yeah, well, he doesn't like her. We know that. But no, I, I think I don't. I, I don't think she's right. I mean, she. she uh, you don't. You 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 save money when the economy is. Uh, that's when 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 the government saving function should grow. When the economy is near full employment. It, it, there's no saving. You, the saving doesn't happen if the if the economy is 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 uh, somnolent or or, um, uh, or stagnant. You don't get the saving. I mean, people try to save. This is Keynes's very well known paradox of thrift. After all, people people may desire to save more, but if their saving causes their incomes to fall, they end up saving less. Thanks. Time for a couple more questions. Uh, let's go to the gentleman in the glasses and the end of the row. Um, just a quick question about sort of the confidence fairy. What should, in your view, policymakers do if, go if the markets panic and decide that government spending is too high and demand retrenchment, but yet in order to stimulate, in order to prevent further contraction, the longer term economic policy would require an increase in government spending? They print money. <laughs> That's simple. If you have your own central bank, you can see off the bond markets. And in fact, they have. There was never, I mean, Britain was never in the same position as Greece or Italy. Um, and uh, it was just an excuse. Osborne wanted to do it anyway. In fact, he did, he's, a, he's a curious case, Osborne, because he actually gave an extraordinary interview. I don't know whether you saw it. It was printed in The Guardian. said that in 2012, I was in despair. My policy wasn't working. I locked myself in my room and wouldn't see anyone. And I wouldn't listen to any, 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 anyone who disagreed with me. Yeah. I mean, he knew it. He knew that it wasn't working. <laughs> Let's go to the sort of pink purple shirt. Let's wait for the microphone. Hi, um, I was two purple shirts. <laughs> okay. I was um, I was just wondering why you think that um, Keynes is often portrayed as quite left wing because in many ways he's conservative with a small c in the sense of kind of defending capitalism in a sense from the, the, the they often say don't they Keynes saved capitalism from the capitalists and how far the Conservative Party might switch the other, how far Hammond might go the other way in terms of becoming a more full-blooded Keynesian, if you like. Well, you know, they're, 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 um, he, 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 he doesn't think the Soviet Union works. I mean, that was the alternative model at the time. Um, uh, and, and so he, he thought you could have a social capitalism, which is after all, I mean, in a way you could say he was a social democrat. Um, uh, and um, uh, but he was always a liberal in politics. I mean, liberal party supporter. He was never a Labour Party supporter, nor a Conservative Party supporter. Um, uh, he, but he did make some pretty radical remarks. For example, he said um, he looked forward um, uh, to the social <coughs> socialisation of investment. Well, socialisation, nationalisation, they're very, very similar. He looked forward to the euthanasia of the rentier, um, uh, people earning unearned income. Uh, and those are quite radical ideas. Um, but he was also 
interested in getting things done. And he, 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 he presented ideas that could be taken up even by a conservative government. Um, so he was a middle way person. I mean, he, he wrote, I mean, he wrote a, a, something on the middle way. And I think of him as a middle way person. He wanted, he wanted um, effective policy to make sure that economies actually grew strongly and that everyone had a job. And then he said, look, I've left other ideas here. When you're in this position, now let's think about the future a bit more. I mean, that tended to be his view. We have a short time for one final question. Uh, let's go to the woman with the blonde hair. Um, in terms of the 2008 financial collapse, specifically in the United States, um, you did mention that it was largely unprecedented and that it wasn't something that anyone really predicted when, in fact, there, according to my perception and reading, there were, now that we see, warning signs that did lead to that collapse. What would you say um, sort of led to that almost systemic blind eye to the warning signs that were there in the economy in the United States during that time? Yeah, the theory, the theory of efficient markets, that financial markets uh, um, accurately, uh, could accurately calculate risks, and therefore they were doing so. And um, they ignored the fact, you know, that house prices were rising uh, and rising and rising, and that all the securitization, um, all, 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 all the assets being created, liquid assets, were based on rising house prices. And all the banks held them. And therefore, any, any interruption in that rise would actually leave them with masses of non-performing loans, um, the, all the financial system. And, and why were they blind to it? Well, why are, why are people blind to things? You know, <coughs> uh, why, why, I mean, it, it's, 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 a, it's a very profound question, but we, we, we inhabit mindsets of one kind or another, which blinds us to the possibility of things happening, um, uh, because they're, they're out, outside the realm of the possible. Why um, did no one anticipate Brexit? except in this country, or when I say no one anticipated, well, even the Brexiters didn't think they were going to win. Why didn't Trump even think he was going to win? We know that from, from um, uh, and certainly it was a big surprise. So why, why do we exclude certain possibilities from our ways of thought? Partly because what we've been taught, what we are being taught, what we read in the newspapers, where we get our ideas from about the normal state of the world that can't be overturned. Um, I think that's really how it happens. There were particular technical reasons in financial economics uh, why they didn't anticipate the crash. And in fact, after the crash, Alan Greenspan, who was um, chair, chair of the Fed for years while all this irrational exuberance was going on, as he called it, he said, my whole intellectual structure has disintegrated. Um, what I never anticipated was his phrase, the underpricing of risk worldwide. Well, if he, did, if he couldn't anticipate it, you know, something is wrong with his intellectual structure, isn't it? <coughs> well, that note, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Uh, please remain seated whilst, whilst our speaker leaves, but first join me in thanking Lord Skidelsky.